Welcome, everybody. Thank you very much for joining us after lunch. Hopefully, uh, this presentation will catch you uh, awake uh, and ready to go, even though it was right after lunch. My name is Darren Landon. I'm with the credentialing development team uh, at Salesforce, uh, responsible for working on a number of the certification exams. And I am a senior credentialing uh, developer. And today, we're going to talk about a very fun and exciting at least I hope it's a fun and exciting uh, discussion about exam guides and what they mean to you and how we can use the things that we go through in developing an exam to bring to life exam guides in a way that helps you prepare and study for uh, the CTA, or not the CTA necessarily, but all of the uh, architect-related exam guides. Uh, but before we get going to that, I would like a volunteer to read our looking forward statement. Anybody want to read that? Just kidding. We're not going to read this. Uh, what we're going to be go talking about today uh, does not contain anything that is very forward-looking as related to Salesforce, but it does have a lot of information uh, in this discussion about what uh, goes into the making of an exam guide. So before we uh, get going into too many of the things that are important to us as exam developers, we're going to talk about the exam goals, why we're doing this, uh, what is an exam guide exactly, and how do I leverage that exam guide to help me prepare for taking an exam. Um, breaking down the exam guide objectives, what those objectives mean, and the science that goes behind developing those exam guides or exam objectives. And then lastly, we want to know how I can use that to prepare for the designer exam. So we're going to use some examples that go into uh, the, the work that we do as exam developers or credential developers. So probably the first thing we want to uh, really identifies why are we doing this? Well, a while back, Salesforce decided that we wanted to bring about a certain number of jobs to the Salesforce ecosystem. And in order to do that, we have to build a community of certified individuals. And with that certification comes a certain number of skills that they get to share with one another in the, in the community. The net of all that is the revenue that we want to generate because we believe at Salesforce that in uh, developing individual talents and skills and their abilities and the knowledge that goes into all that will help bring about a certain amount of revenue. So why? There's a growing need for credentials uh, or candidates uh, to become successful at taking the designer certification exams. On their path to becoming a certified uh, application or system architect. In understanding the objectives, so you get an exam guide and there's a bunch of objectives that says how many, what uh, a certain percentage of an exam is associated with an objective. What does that mean to you? We're going to break that down in a little bit. So many of you are here because you've seen this pyramid before. This pyramid identifies the pathway to become a certified technical architect. But as you see, the bulk of that is in the actual middle of the pyramid, which consists of a number of certification exams. Today, we've got the uh, Certified Data Architecture Management Designer for Certified Application Architect. For Certified System Architect, you've got Development Lifecycle and Deployment Designer. Notice that all those that are in this middle section have a designer uh, title to it. That title is important to you because it relates to the type of individual job role that you will perform as a designer in this particular, uh, one of these particular domains. So 
These three certification tiers recognize what we call KSAs, knowledge, skills, and abilities, as well as your growing expertise in the Salesforce platform. Now, this is where we kind of get down into the nitty gritty of what it is that we do as credential developers. The first thing that we do is we do perform what is called a job task analysis. But actually, even before then, that job task analysis is part of a bigger, broader design. And that design is at the, uh, really at the core of what it is that we do. We design a program first, and then from that program, there are individual exams. Those individual exams make up the program. And many of you are aware of what that pyramid, as we just showed you, is all about. If you're not, um, you can actually, uh, one of my colleagues is here with me today, and myself, we can answer any questions related to the architect program itself. If not, please visit the architect area and they'll be able to help you out. So the job task analysis, we call that a JTA. Everybody loves acronyms in the uh, technical field. We like to use acronyms also. The job task analysis is where we take eight to 10 subject matter experts, many of you may be a subject matter expert in a particular area, and we then start to take the job that we are going to analyze and break it down into little tiny pieces. From there, once we've broken it down, we create what is called a blueprint. That blueprint then is used to create test items, or in this case uh, of the designer exams, test questions. We call them test items because they are not always in the format of a question. Once we're done creating questions, we want to see how well they do. This is part of the science behind creating an exam. We use a process called psychometrics. Psychometrics is nothing more than psychology and statistics. Put them together and you get psychometrics. Once we find out how well the test questions perform, we keep those that do well. We toss out the ones that don't do well and then we go live with a bunch of test items. Um, now, the exam guide. What is that? And what do you use that for? The exam guide is the foundation to your understanding what that exam is all about. We come up with a, a few different uh, areas. One is called the minimally qualified candidate. The minimally qualified candidate is really, if you took uh, a number of different hurdles. Let's take three hurdles, for example. One hurdle is relatively low, and we take a hurdle that's medium height, and then we take one that's pretty high. The minimally qualified candidate in this example would be one who can actually get over that middle hurdle. This is the pass-fail person. So if the pass-fail score is 65%, that person gets 65%. Anybody who's below that, they, they may be informed and can't get over that low hurdle, but quite, can't quite get above the other hurdle. And those that are clearly qualified are able to go over the higher hurdle. We use those three hurdles to determine the type of questions that we keep in an exam, for example, when we do our psychometric analysis. The next thing is the objectives. And then the question format, the objectives are built in a way scientifically to tell the test item writers or the test question writers what type of question that you need to, or that, uh, that the subject matter expert needs to write. So that minimally qualified candidate has a minimum candidate background. That minimum candidate background is based on the second item on this list, and that is some job role information. It is also has to do with the KSAs, or the skills and domain knowledge and the experience that that individual has. So as you're preparing for becoming an architect, whether it be system or application architect,
you can take a look at the minimally qualified candidate statement to help you determine whether or not you are qualified to start on the path to becoming certified. Now, this, all this information, by the way, applies to all of our certification exams, not just the application and system architect or designer exams. So this one's kind of really cool. I get excited about this stuff. The objective components contain four areas one of which is the audience. Who are we talking to? Now, in most cases, as you read these objectives on the exam guide, you may, find, you may not see the audience because the audience is implied in most of our exam objectives. The second thing is what behavior are you going to be going through? in order to prepare or to answer a particular question. It might mean you need to design something. It might mean you need to solve for something. Then there's a condition. What conditions exist? It's a broken system it's, or a broken design. There's some broken code. There's, it could be a number of different areas. And then which degree of mastery is expected of you? You need to create a solution for some, all, whatever the case may be, there will be a degree of mastery involved. Now, the cognitive levels. The cognitive levels are the things that we think of inside of our head. There's comprehension, application, analysis, problem solving. We also call that synthesis in some cases. Now, what does that mean? Well, if you were to actually look at these cognitive levels, comprehension is easiest to problem solving is the most difficult. So if you see an exam objective that requires you to or asks you to do something that is in the area of problem solving, you can con uh, consider that going to be difficult questions that you find on the exam. So, an example. This is an actual example from one of our exams. Given a customer scenario, what does that mean? That means that you are going to see a scenario-based question on the exam. You're not going to see a question that says, list all of the design requirements for a given solution. Then you're going to see the green, which is the, beha or the behavior. Design a data model. That is what you're going to actually have to do. Now, that doesn't mean that the question in the exam is you will design a data model. What that means is there's going to be a data model related design question that you have to solve for. It might be a missing piece to a design. It might be anything related that would require you to des as part of designing. The last thing is the degree of, ma or the condition, excuse me, the condition in this case, I already mentioned, but the degree of mastery is a fairly long one in this case. Our objectives can get very complex. Understanding these will help you in your development of your readiness for taking an exam. So in this case, we want something that's scalable, that supports all business processes. So you got to design something that uh, fulfills that need. And then it has to have the appropriate level of customizations, et cetera. All of that gray area is the degree of mastery that we expect on an exam. So biggest question that you have in this case is, am I ready to take an exam? How many of you have ever asked that question? How many of you get done asking that question and go, no, I'm not? Well, hopefully today's session actually helps you better prepare for taking the exam. So one of the first things that you want to ask is, do I have experience or fit within the job role? Again, we base our exams on a job role not a job title. So in this case, it's a designer. 
And am I part of the, ex uh, the audience? If I'm not part of the audience that is listed in the exam guide, then you have to ask yourself a bigger question. What do I need to do to get into that area? If you knew, are new and want to get into becoming an architect, this is a great opportunity here at Trailhead DX to talk to those who are experienced. Find the pathway that they've taken to get there. And then have you adequately studied the exam outline? You definitely want to make sure that you have gone through all the objectives and know roughly what percentage of the exam is going to be on a particular objective. The next thing is breaking down the, those ob exam objectives. I saw some of you taking pictures um, of the uh, breakdown. This is a good opportunity to every time you see one of these exam objectives, you can actually go through and start listing out all the things that you have experience with with the particular exam objective and those things that you don't have experience with. If you can answer yes to all three of the above questions, then you can rest assured that you have adequately prepared to take the exam. That does not mean you're going to pass. I wish we could say that, but it, it, unfortunately it doesn't. Um, so one of the things that uh, I want to go ahead and talk to you about really briefly is an, a quick example. Uh, this isn't related to certification. It's related to one of my passions, and that's called canyoneering. I've been with people who do canyoneering. For those of you who don't know what canyoneering is, and uh, I do most of it in the mountains of the southern Utah, where canyoneers go down and they rappel down mountains. There are those that get adequately prepared to rappel down those mountains. They may come up come uh, into some obstacles along the way, but they're able to get down safely and adequately. There are those who are not able to get down because they just go ahead, they get into accidents, they haven't prepared, they don't have the right equipment, and it happens all the time. Uh, and that just recently happened. The reason why I bring this up is because that recently happened to a group of women who were trying to go canyoneering and got caught in some floods. How do we relate that to certification? Well, that basically means that if we adequately prepare, we can be confident in our ability to take these exams. You spend a considerable amount of money to take these certification exams. We want to see you pass. Salesforce wants to see you pass. The better you prepared you are, the better off you're going to be prepared to pass not only the designer exams, but any subsequent exams from there. Thank you very much. If you have any questions, Randy Hugie and myself are here to help you out, answer any particular questions. Thank you.